State your name and where you were born. My name is uh, William Patrick McCord. I was born in Elizabethtown, Kentucky in 1959. And where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Carn City, Texas, about 120 miles south of here. And uh, what were you doing in 1965? <laughs> well, born in uh, 59, 65, I was, uh, I was six years old. And so my father was in the military and I was living in Aschaffenburg, Germany at that time uh, with his service. So you have uh, been a global traveler or resident in a sense, uh, being connected with the service. Uh, yes, um, with my, uh, in my youth with my father, traveling back and forth to Germany. We were stationed there twice. And so I've spent six or seven years as a resident in Germany. And since getting out of, uh, my father getting out of the military and being rehired or retired, um, I have, uh, become part of a business that involves me traveling to Europe, to England, um, to Thailand, the Philippines, and a number of other places, China, Russia, so forth. Did you learn any second languages? In well, as a, as a young man, I could speak German. Um, so you don't practice it, you forget it. So I can still um, count and swear and a few other things in German, but I, I can't be conversational in anymore. Um, I've studied Spanish and I'm currently studying Spanish, so I think that uh, by the end of this year I'll have a fairly good command of the, the Spanish language. And I uh, studied Russian for two years to help with the business that we did, the company that I worked for, the business we did over there required some knowledge of the Russian language, so I speak bits and pieces of Russian, just enough to get by. Corn City has also changed in uh, the decades. It's, uh, it's amazing the change that's going on down there. Um, when I grew up in Carn City, we were a very small community of less than 4,000 people. Um, today, Carn City is 25,000 people, but it's all due to the oil business. They uh, started the fracking boom down there in the Eagle Ford Shale, and, uh, and it has certainly changed the, the complexion of all of the communities Carn City and surrounding Kennedy, Floresville. The fracking business is making millions of dollars. A lot of people that I went to high school with are now millionaires, and they're millionaires because there's oil under their land. So uh, what brought you to Pflugerville? Well, when, uh, when I graduated high school, I joined the Navy, and I did six years of service in the United States Navy. And when I got back out of the Navy, uh, I was going to come to Texas and move to Austin and work for Motorola. I arrived here in November of 1984, and uh, Motorola had just started a hiring freeze, and so I wasn't able to get a job there. So I secured another job in the Austin area and actually lived in Austin for about six years. But we came to Pflugerville to go to church. The churches in Austin were so big and and, uh, and that wasn't really what we were used to. And so we started coming to St. Elizabeth's Catholic Church in Pflugerville. And one afternoon we were doing a fundraising bike ride and it ended in the park. We drove through the neighborhood and I saw that there were lots for sale. I went and signed for a lot in Pflugerville that day and put my house on the market the next day. And six months later I lived in Pflugerville. You got involved in community activities uh, and in service. Uh, so uh, what was your uh, first encounter with the city of Pflugerville as far as volunteering? Well, in, uh, in the city of Pflugerville, it was not hard to become involved in volunteering. There were um, a lot of organizations were looking for people to participate. Uh, our daughter um, started off in, uh, in the middle schools she attended Timmerman Elementary, and uh, we were involved in some small activities at the school at Timmerman. But in the bigger picture, uh, the church, um, there was a lot of activities involved in the church. And at that time, our church participated in Deutschenfest. So I helped our church with the Deutschenfest activities and eventually became active in Deutschenfest, participated on the Deutschenfest committee, for over 15 years and actually chaired the Deutschenfest for five years in a row. And, uh, and that in itself led me to become involved with the city. Um, I felt like uh, there was uh, a need for some voices in the city government um, that were new 
And so I ran and was elected to city council twice. And after I finished my term in the city council, then I became a part of the Parks and Recreation Committee and served there for six years. So um, with regards to volunteer activity in the city, that includes um, I was on the Citizens on Patrol, I was in the first class of Citizens on Patrol, and uh, involved in a lot of other activities around the city. <clears throat> when my daughter was in high school, we were uh, involved with her school activity, and at that time she was in the band, and the band uh, traveled to the Fiesta Bowl Parade, and they traveled to the Rose Bowl Parade, and we were volunteers, fundraisers, and then chaperones and went on both of those trips to California and Arizona to participate in those activities. And uh, volunteerism breeds volunteerism. The more people find out you volunteer, the more they ask you. And, uh, and so I've, uh, I've been asked to participate in a lot of things, homeowners associations, boards of directors, um, different activities around the city, and I've enjoyed all of that. Uh, so let's go back to Deutschenfest. Uh, you, uh were at one time really working with the parade entries. Tell us uh, from your the beginning of time that you were involved to over the 15 or more year period, how the parade evolved and, and what it's like. Well, when, uh, when I first came on the Deutschenfest committee, I just, uh, um, I found that there was an opportunity to become involved. And uh, I contacted the person who was the chairman of Deutschenfest and asked them if they needed another volunteer. Little did I know I was gonna get one of the largest volunteer assignments there, which was running booths at that time. So the first five years, I was involved in, in securing all of the vendor spaces and organizing the layout of the park and uh, making sure that the vendors had what they needed to be able to participate in the Deutschenfest, which led to becoming a participant in the parks department in the infrastructure in the park. At that time, the park was fairly small and there were a lot of um, telephone poles and a lot of wires in the trees, everything. And over the 10 year period that I was involved as the booth chairperson and as the general chair of the Deutschenfest, uh, we removed all of the overhead utilities, buried all of the electrical wires and uh, removed all of those hard facilities from the park, um, which makes it a safer place, especially when there's thunderstorms and some of the tree limbs come down. There's no more power lines to be snapped in the park. In my last five years on the Deutschenfest committee, I was asked to do the parade. And um, when I took over the parade, the number of parade participants were about 25 or 30, mostly some local Boy Scout and church activities and a few local businesses. And uh, we expanded the parade. We reached out to local communities, Round Rock, Holland, um, some uh, places, Luling and Lockhart and told them about our parade and, and we had an unspoken agreement that if they would participate in our parade, we would participate in theirs. And so everybody was game for that. We did that for three to four years and it worked out real well, even to the point that we had to upgrade and get a new float for the city because our old float was old and it had traveled quite a bit. So we, uh, we commissioned and had a new float built for the uh, parade and it's been, uh, it's been traveled well now and uh, one of the local park staff people or a city person takes it and uh, shows it at other festivals and parades. Now let's talk about the city float. Uh, did volunteers build that? Were you there when they had the Beerstein float? Um, I was there. That was the float that we had when I became uh, part of the Deutschenfest committee. And uh, that was the, uh, the longtime float. And it was built, that float was built, I understand, by a community group, that that was a, a self-built float. Um, the new float, we actually commissioned a company that builds floats to, to build the new float that has the gazebo on it. Uh, does that float still exist today? The one with the beer stein? No, uh, no, it, no with, uh, the, uh, gazebo. with the gazebo, yes it does. It, okay. uh, that float is in, stored in the building next to the red barn on, uh, on, on Emanuel Road and we still use that for Deutschenfest. And does the city still go to the other festivals in the communities? We do. Um, we still go to uh, a few events, and that's, uh, again, dependent on the availability, typically of a city staff person to take the float and pull it in the parade, and then we also have somebody to ride on it. So if we have a local official or a local family or someone like that, then they will ride the float. Um, 
let's go back to the actual uh, park and the vendors that are there. That uh, the number of vendors also expanded, just like the number of participants in the. Uh, Right. Yeah, when I took over the the booth activity at Deutschenfest, there were there was a catalog of about 40 vendors, 40 to 45 vendors that came on a regular basis. And again, a lot of those were local organizations, local activities and fundraisers, and um, churches, Boy Scout troops, so forth. And there was desire to grow the festival a little bit to add more vendors. And for a period of time, once we put the word out that we were accepting vendors, we started to, to get overrun with uh, out-of-town vendors. And we received a few comments from local people that they thought that, that there needed to be a little bit more um, local church charity and activity and exclude some of the out-of-town vendors. And so a rule was written into the city charter or the city ordinance that runs Deutschenfest that says that when we get ready to accept applications for the first 30 to 45 days, all of those applicants are only local church charity and nonprofit vendors. And then once that is done, then we accept the outside vendors. So it still keeps it steered as a Pflugerville centered activity. Well, and there have been uh, some core groups, uh, as you mentioned, like Santa Elizabeth's always had the hamburgers. Yes. And the uh, Lions and the Rotary had the beer, and then some of the school organizations had uh, different uh, booths. And that, for those organizations, those that event was their primary fundraiser. Yes. Um, at Deutschenfest, the local activities that that participate, as you mentioned, St. Elizabeth's Church, the Lions Club, the Boy Scout Troops, the Girl Scout Troops, um, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, a number of the local churches. Um, this, the Deutschenfest is one of their largest um, annual fundraisers. The Lions Club sports local scholarships. The St. Elizabeth's Church uses their money for scholarships for students. And the Boy Scouts use it for their summer camp fund. So the money that's raised at Deutschenfest by the local activities typically runs straight back into the local community. There's also a number of sporting organizations, the youth soccer groups and the youth baseball groups. They try to have a booth there also and, and uh, raise some money for their, their activity. When you're talking about volunteer, that is a huge task, and uh, I assume it's nearly a 12-month ordeal that you have to start planning ahead, and uh, then it gets very... Uh, yes. Most volunteer activities, especially the Deutschenfest, um, when you finish Deutschenfest in May, uh, you start planning for the next Deutschenfest in July. Um, you have to line up your entertainment a year ahead of time. You have to secure some of the contracts for performers, um, a long, long lead. And then there are uh, other activities. You have to plan around the park uh, if there's going to be any infrastructure upgrades or equipment changes in the park. We had to plan for that. And um, you know, it's not unlike any other volunteer activity at the St. Elizabeth's Church that I'm involved in. We have an annual festival, a uh, church festival. Um, I've chaired that twice, my wife and I have, and we've been active and participated in it every year since we've lived in Pflugerville, but it's also an activity that plans year-round. You have uh, a number of different activities at a, at a festival or an event, uh, vendors, food, um, entertainers, all of those type of things, um, long-range planning um, to make sure you're successful on the day that it takes place. And one of the big challenges is you can do all of this planning and then there is an outside factor called weather that comes <laughs> into effect. And who makes that decision or how, how do you do if you're the committee chair or on the committee to deal with those unforeseen circumstances? Well, in the unforeseen circumstances, the interesting thing is we plan for that. And uh, the Deutschenfest has only been rained out, to my knowledge, twice, um, where it was rained so bad that it had to be either postponed or canceled. Um, and one of them was the year before I came on the committee. It rained so hard in the park, the ground was soft and was gonna remain soft, so they held it downtown. And then once I was on the committee, we had, uh, we had very severe weather uh, the week before. And uh, we planned and planned for it. Well, then it rained on the Friday. We canceled that Friday, but we maintained Saturday and Sunday and had a successful festival. The city buys insurance against rain, believe it or not, uh, for the festival. There's a company that issues a, a rain policy, and so you buy rain insurance, and there's a meteorologist that stays in the park that weekend, and he measures the weather and the rain. And if it rains a certain amount, then you get a 
uh, settlement payment from the insurance company for the loss of, of revenue, planned revenue from the activity. So there's, it's interesting that you can buy insurance for rain, but you can. So. Do you have any vision for future Deutsche Fest? Well, I, you know, I think that um, the city of Pflugerville is growing, and the festival has almost outgrown the capacity of the, the venue that it is the park. It's very convenient, it's very nice that, uh, it, that it, it's held in such a great location. Uh, it's one block from my house, so uh, it makes it very easy for me to participate and attend. But um, realistically, um, the festival will eventually outgrow the park. Um, either either there will have to be a decision made that we want the festival to always be of a certain size, which means that it won't ever earn as much money as it does the, in the previous years, or it's going to have to move and grow. And so if it has to move and grow, maybe moving to the lake or moving to a new location, this new billion dollar downtown complex that they're talking about, maybe there would be the possibility of moving it there. But um, within the confines of the Pfluger Grove Park, eventually the fest will outgrow that. It, the potential of growing the festival is limitless. Um, entertainment is a big draw. And so if you want to double or triple the size of the festival, you hire bigger name entertainers and draw the crowd. Um, I think that, that as I left the festival committee a few years ago, the group was evenly split among those people that wanted to grow and those people that wanted to stay the same. So eventually that decision will be made, but I think it's probably five to ten years out. The uh, dances associated are now all in the park, or do there, is there still a street dance on Main Street? All of the uh, dances now, all of the entertainment uh, that comes with Deutschenfest now is held in the park um, on the basketball court. And uh, yes, it used to be when I first started with Deutschenfest, there was a street dance, typically either Friday night or Saturday night in the middle of downtown. Um, we stopped doing that um, early on. Um, I was still running the booths at the time when they discontinued the street dance. And I think one of the reasons for that was the division of resources and the division of the crowd is that when everybody was downtown at the dance, nobody was in the park with the vendors and the activities that were going, the carnival that were going on down there. So when you combine it all together, it tended to, to make it generate more revenue. Um, in the early uh, stages of Deutschenfest, they also had like um, a Miss Deutschenfest contest. Yes. Were you uh, in the early stages? That had already been discontinued, perhaps. That had been discontinued when uh, when I came onto the Deutschenfest committee. Interestingly enough, the parade used to line up on City Park Road and Rolling Meadow Street where I live, and the city float used to park across my driveway and. Uh, one of the very first years that we lived in our house and they started lining up for the Deutschenfest, it was a summer and it was 106 degrees out. And so as we waited for the parade to start, we invited all of the, the Deutschenfest queens, the beauty queens, and the gentlemen from the um, Lions Club to come sit in our living room until the parade started to roll because it was so hot that day. And a couple of years later, they moved the parade down onto um, Railroad Avenue. But for the first few years we lived in Pflugerville, the parade would always line up, and the first float was typically near our driveway. And the early Deutschenfest, I think, started maybe in June, and then they were uh, then a May venue was determined. Yes, all the time I was on the committee, the Deutschenfest was a May event. But um, in looking at some of the history of Deutschenfest and some of the activities, it used to be a summer event. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Santa Elizabeth. You mentioned okay. that you uh, uh, are a parishioner there, and uh, that uh, is uh, a church with uh, a lot of history in the community. Um, tell us a little bit about the history of the church or its uh, growth from decades ago to present. Well, when we moved to Pflugerville, my wife and I moved here. We had our daughter, um, and we moved uh, into this community. St. Elizabeth's Church was the church that we had been attending for almost four years. We had lived in Austin, but we were commuting to church in Pflugerville. It was a small church at the time. We had the uh, old uh, historical church building that sits on the parking lot, and then there had been built a multi-purpose hall that um, we were using as a church building because we had outgrown the small chapel. So if you went to church on Saturday night, 
you could actually have church in the chapel because the crowd was small enough to fit in there. But any of the Sunday church sessions were held in the hall. And we had three services then. We had the uh, 5 o'clock Saturday, and we had a 8.30 and 11.30 mass in the hall. Um, the church has grown considerably um, since, since we've lived here. Uh, the church now is, is over 800 families. It's, um, it's, we built the sanctuary building many, many years ago. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it's been almost 12 years now. The, um, and so all of the primary church services are held in the large sanctuary building, but on, on major weekends, Easter, Christmas, and so forth, we actually have to have multiple services, both in the church and in the hall building. Um, the, the, footprint of the church is continuing to grow. Right now we're building um, our third expansion project, which we're building a two-story religious education building um, on the site. And there is a 15-year plan for the church, which eventually includes um, building an entirely new sanctuary, that the old sanctuary will be too small. Um, it was built with the ability to grow, and will probably grow at one time, but then eventually um, the area that's currently the parking lot will become the new sanctuary building. I've served in many capacities in the St. Elizabeth's Church. In my early days there, I volunteered for just about everything that they would ask me to do, construction, um, landscaping, helping with the Deutschenfest activities that the church conducted. And uh, eventually I was on the um, church's pastoral council. Um, when I was on the pastoral council, we bought the three acres of land that was between the church and at that time Parkcrest Middle School. Um, Parkcrest had not been built yet. It was an empty field, but there was a three acre tract of land between us and that large piece of property. And so as the pastoral council um, president, um, we made a, an activity, an effort to buy that and we were able to secure that. Um, in future days, now I wasn't on the pastoral council, but I was still very active in the church when the um, Kimple property became available that is just to the west of the church, there were 11 acres there, um, our church secured that land also. And so in, in the future long-term plan, um, that will be the parking lot. It'll probably be a residence out there. Um, today there's a softball diamond being built there and uh, the church will eventually fill the entire 17 and a half acres that, that it has. So does that property go nearly to that storage facility? It does. It goes all the way over and makes contact with the fence line. And it's a prime location uh, as the city has grown now at the intersection of Railroad and uh, Pflugerville Parkway, which is uh, easy to find. It is, it is very easy to find and it's, it's currently very easy to access. Um, the, as they built out um, Pecan Street or Railroad Avenue and as they built out Pflugerville Parkway, they've made sure to provide median cuts so that we can enter and exit the church easily. And that piece of property, I didn't realize it when, when we made the 11 acre purchase, that that piece of property ran all the way from what is currently Pflugerville Parkway all the way to Pecan Street as a single tract that ran the full length of that. So it, uh, it, it come, came up the other side right where the, um, where the uh, veterinaries clinic and so forth. That piece of property ran the full so length. Crosses over Finney. It crossed the entire direction. Yeah. That, so. that's a, that was a, a, a good buy. That was a, it was a very big, large piece of land. Yes. Um, back to uh, city and church. Uh, the city eventually started. Uh, a, I call it a Christmas parade. There may be another yes. name for it, but it was really the Knights of Columbus that uh, that were very. Uh, imp uh, involved in getting it to happen? Yes, the, um, the Christmas parade, uh, when it began, um, again, many years ago, the St. Elizabeth's Church early on had a men's club. They didn't have a Knights of Columbus um, chapter there, a council there. Um, when the men's club converted to a Knights of Columbus group, um, about 30 men got together and we decided to form an official Knights of Columbus group within our first three or four years, a gentleman within our um, organization named Benny Matus, who is actually a teacher in the Pflugerville ISD School District, um, Benny Matus said that he thought that it was our responsibility to make sure and state that Christmas was about Christ. 
and that he thought we could put out a Christmas parade and always center the theme locally using the cooperation of some of the local churches and organizations to uh, celebrate Christmas and celebrate it appropriately but always remind people that Christmas is about the birth of Christ. And so um, Benny uh, Matus, he chaired and coordinated that parade for the first three or four years and then it became a regular activity for the Knights of Columbus and the Knights of Columbus have sponsored, coordinated and run the Christmas parade ever since then. Uh, and I think uh, it, uh, the number of young people involved in the parade locally yes. is phenomenal. Yes, if you've ever been to the parade and you're there along the parade route, you'll see a um, large amount of youth groups, organizations, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Brownies, Cub Scouts, um, sports organizations, youth sports organizations. The churches bring out very large numbers of their youth groups. So, uh, and there's uh, certainly a lot of uh, youth participation in the Christmas parade. I don't know that it's connected with that, but another first for Santa Elizabeth, I remember, was the breakfast with Santa. Yes. For the whole community, and everybody came to get pancakes and to meet Santa. Even yeah. the elderly people. <laughs> yes, and it, um, the breakfast with Santa, uh, it's gone on at St. Elizabeth's for quite some time. I started taking pictures for the Breakfast with Santa activity. Um, we used to do it on film, and we would take uh, 36 exposure rolls of film, and we would shoot those pictures and hand them out for free. And uh, we would take um, 20 to 25 rolls of film um, to be processed, and we would print those pictures, and then people could come by the church and pick them up. And um, it was quite an activity. I've taken pictures of that event now for over 20 years, and have seen through my camera lens three generations of, uh, of children through that uh, event. And it still goes on, it has a lot of competition now. A lot of other organizations have started Breakfast with Santa or Christmas Breakfast, uh, Santa Breakfast and so forth. Uh, but the St. Elizabeth's activity still draws a fairly uh, steady crowd. Um, breakfast with Santa with pancakes and then there's um, you know, activities and, and Santa's there and he'll listen to what the kids want for Christmas and collect their Christmas lists from them. Um, so uh, you um, are a known photographer in the city uh, and have been behind the camera for many events. How did you get into uh, photography? I began taking pictures very young. Um, I would say that I was always playing with a camera of one sort or another all the way back to when I was 14 or 15 years old. I took photography in high school when I was in Carn City High School. I worked on the yearbook staff for the photography there and helped put together three yearbooks at our um, high school. And I, um, I just continued on with that activity. I studied photography, never gave it up. I went into the Navy um, I took a lot of pictures when I was in the Navy of my experiences and what I had seen there. Uh, when I got out of the military and settled into Pflugerville, uh, photography was a part of my life. I'd been taking pictures for a long time. And as a volunteer, um, and most of the time as a donation, I would offer to take pictures at different events. And in the city of Pflugerville, I've taken pictures at, at thousands of events. Um, and there are um, some that are, are repeat activities year on year, like the Relay for Life. Um, I've taken pictures of that uh, every year for many, many years in the St. Elizabeth's Breakfast with Santa. And I help out at Hendrickson High School, and I've taken pictures at, at Pflugerville football games uh, for 14 years now. Every game, never missed a game except for when my uh, daughter graduated college. And that was when Fleurville was on the run for the state playoffs. So I kept going to Coach Herman every week and I said, I can't be here this week, so you have to win because I'll be back next week. And then I didn't know about uh, um, the church service that they had the following week. So I went back to him and I said, okay, Coach, I can't be here this weekend either, so you have to win so I can come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a lot of fun following the football team to the state championship game. Uh, but I've done that. I've stood on the sidelines at every single Panther football game with the exception of two for 14 years. And it's been a lot of fun. And that is such a treasure for the athletes, the students, the parents, because they're involved in the event. Right. And to be able to capture that and provide that memory for them to the future is uh, just awesome. And we do it. We do it for free. I've done it uh, for a number of years. It's, the start of it was kind of interesting. Is 
my daughter was in the band at the time and I would go down at halftime and help the band get on and off the field and when I did that I had my camera with me and I knew a few of the players and their parents and one uh, one Friday waiting for the band to finish um, it was homecoming weekend and so I stood there for the end of that quarter and took pictures of some of the football players playing football and then there was the homecoming ceremony and uh, one of the Cole boys Joe Cole's son was on the team and he had hurt himself and so I took a picture of him in the homecoming court and then I stayed on the field and took a few more pictures and after that game as I always did I developed the pictures and the next week when I was on the sidelines I went around and I found those parents well one of those parents happened to be Rob Tiemann and I had taken uh, several pictures of his boy and he asked me he said what would it take to have you do something like this every week and I said well you know it cost money to print the pictures because at that time we were shooting on film I said we would have to have a little bit of commitment of, of doing that and so um, so he said well let's do that so he went out and wanted me to teach him how to take pictures and so I worked with Rob and he and I would stand on the sidelines for the three remaining years that his boys were on the team and we took hundreds thousands of pictures and would have them developed and would hand them out to the parents for free. In the last year that his uh, youngest son Luke was on the team um, he wanted to go digital so we went out and bought digital cameras and set up a website and have done that now for 12 years with all digital pictures all free nobody has to pay anything for any of those pictures and that website has um, in the since the website was started up we track the number of pictures that have been looked at and there's been over 50 million image views on the website with about uh, a million and a half to two million visits per year to that football website right now well it's so cool because I always refer to our students as the greatest ambassador for the city of Pflugerville and the community and uh, again when they see those pictures that tells them that Pflugerville cares about them too and they'll mm -hmm. always remember that photo in Pflugerville wherever they happen to go. Wherever they are. Yeah and there's there have been other events too in Pflugerville that have been um, remarkable events. Um, after 9-11 we had the 9-11 ceremony at the football stadium. Very very good event, very emotional event so I thought that was incredible. I took pictures and I shot video while I was there um, when we dedicated the Fallen Warrior Memorial, um, the event there, um, I have some pictures there that I've never even shared with people. There, you know, there have been a number of events in Pflugerville that are, that are remarkable. Even just the band being invited to the Rose Bowl Parade and being able to go out there and sit there and watch them come down the street. It's an uh, it's amazing event. So, um, and the name Pflugerville, you know, gets national recognition, international recognition, you know my uh, my sports and photo website that hosts all of these pictures of all of these events um, regularly takes visits from from Europe, Asia, Russia, number of places, and these are people that are related to people in Pflugerville or are people whose families serve overseas. They don't have a chance to watch their um, relative play football or basketball, but they can go to the website and see them in pictures. Uh. The initiative behind the Fallen Warrior Memorial uh, again happened after 9-11 and we had, uh, I think we have four Fallen Warriors uh, past that time. Do you know the story on how the Fallen Warrior came to be? I don't know the complete story, but um, at that time when, uh, when the initial idea for building the memorial came up, um, I was in my last couple of years of the City Council and uh, I was aware of the activity at that time that was being acted by Mike Marsh, a local a community individual, that felt like it was an important thing to, to put up a monument to recognize um, the people from Pflugerville that have served in the military and have lost their life um, in the service of the country. And so I know that he had tremendous support in, in getting it done. Um, there was a a little bit of a challenge in the fundraising activity for it, but the uh, the site selection for it is is amazing, and the the monument um, is something to go visit. It's uh, it's interesting. You live relatively close to Gillian Creek, and uh, again, weather can sometimes uh, <laughs> cause uh, the runoff to exceed the banks. So, do you remember any flood events? <laughs> yes. Um, when we moved to Pflugerville, 
the very first week we were here, there was a hailstorm. And so it was an incredible hailstorm. And so we had just moved into a brand new house. We didn't even have our furniture yet. And it rained and rained and hailed. And, uh, and I was curious as to how high the creek would rise during uh, a significant rain storm. So the next morning, I got out and walked down the street into the entrance of the park. And there was water all the way up to the bathrooms that are, that are there off the main entrance to the park. And so not being totally familiar with it, I couldn't remember how far that was to the creek or how deep it was, but it appeared that the water was moving aggressively um, through the park. And since then, there have been at least three other major flood events uh, in the park. One, um, one happened, uh, the the night of the close of the Deutschenfest, we were, uh, we were finishing up um, Deutschenfest on a Saturday night. We used to not have a Sunday night event at Deutschenfest and a huge thunderstorm moved in and everybody left the park and when we came back into the park the next morning on Sunday to start putting things away and cleaning up, several of the large trees had fallen down in the park. But the other thing that you could see was that the water line in the middle of the night had already been up almost over the tops of the picnic tables in the park. So. Um, the water got really deep then, and then one time following that, the water got so deep that it got into the swimming pool. And I think that's happened twice um, since, the, since the pool has been built, is that the creek has gotten high enough to get into the pool. And uh, there is a picture that I've only seen once, but I haven't seen anywhere else, where at this most recent large flood event, that if you looked at the fallen warrior memorial, all you could see was the heads of the soldiers sticking out of the water because the water was so deep it had covered almost the entire warrior monument down there. So that's, that's a lot of water in the park. I want to go back to your city council days. Um, what were some of the challenges that the city was facing at that time? And uh, remind us again of the period of time that you served. Oh. Well, I served for six years, and I've been off the city council for about six years, so um, I would have to do the backwards math there. About 2003. About 2003. We had three huge challenges when, when I was on the city council, and that was traffic, water, and growth. And uh, all three of those things were just always present in the, the mind of the city. We had an excellent reputation as a growth city. We had an excellent reputation for schools, excellent reputation for the police department that we had in our crime rate, but um, it was getting incredibly difficult to move around in Pflugerville. Uh, when I first moved here, all the way from I-35 down into downtown, it was a two-lane road. And the city had already started working on that before I got on the council, but that didn't solve the problem. There were a lot of other roads that had problems. The, uh, the Railroad Avenue out towards the Catholic Church and the Emanuel Road. Um, all of those roads were simple two-lane roads that during the morning and evening rush hour just became incredibly burdened with traffic. And even on the weekends, just regular weekend traffic was very burdensome on the roads. Um, we knew that we had a water issue in Pflugerville and we knew that was going to limit growth. And um, there was, a, at that time, our mayor was a, a man named Doyle Bridge Farmer. And Doyle Bridge Farmer, um, at the city council meeting, mentioned several times, he said, if we don't solve our water problem, the city will not grow. And he was uh, almost visionary in what he kept talking about. And so we, um, as the city council, took on studies to find out what we could do about solving our water problem. At that time, the city lived off of seven wells. We had wells drilled. And we had negotiated the agreement with the city of Austin to have a cross connect to their water system that would give us a half a million gallons a day. At that time in the summer, Pfluger was using six or seven million gallons a day of water. And we were pumping it primarily out of wells. Um, three of our wells went dry and we were relying on some, some very um, good producing wells. But the, um, the, the indication was is that within a few years, that would cease also. So um, we looked at pipelines, we looked at uh, different ways of getting water to the city, and one of the decisions that was made was, was to build Lake Pflugerville, and it would become a water storage reservoir. Um, it's become a wonderful recreational facility now, but the primary purpose of that lake 
is that in the, in the most desperate of times, it's a 30 to 45 day water supply for our projected water consumption in 2018, and we're almost there. Um, we built a million gallon clear well for the water treatment plant. The water treatment plant was the first of its kind in the country, state of the art membrane um, filtration. Uh, it was highly and heavily toured when we, uh, when we first built it. Everybody across the country and across the world, foreign visitors wanted to come and see how it worked because it was a new method of purifying water. Um, there was a big divide in the community at that time that whether we needed it or we didn't um, and that they thought it was a uh, unnecessary expense, but if we had not built the water treatment plant and Lake Pflugerville and the pipeline to the Colorado River, uh, Pflugerville would probably be out of water today. Do you know the contract with LCRA, is that, uh, does that have to be renewed or it's, it's permanent that we will always have access? It's a, it's a long-term contract. So, um, and essentially when the LCRA signs a contract, um, they calculate your water consumption for hundreds of years, and so your contract is renewed on a periodic basis, but your commitment for water from them is, is a long-term commitment unless there are incredibly drastic weather and drought conditions that would cause them to restrict that. They, they're going to hold up to their, their deal. One of the most amusing conversations that I ever had on the city council was with a man from the LCRA when we talked about building the lake and he talked to us about having to pay for the rain that it would catch. And, uh, and so the conversation centered around that, you know, we all thought that God owned the rain. And he says, well, the God, God does own the rain until it touches the ground. When it touches the ground, it belongs to me. So the LCRA, they count for rainfall and the number of inches and everything. If you create a large reservoir that's gonna catch that water, that means it's water that's not passed on to the watershed and so they charge you for it, just like as if you were drawing it out of the watershed. So I thought it was interesting having a conversation about who owns the rain, so. On transportation, uh, one of the things that uh, I think has evolved since 2003 when you were on the uh, council is we now have east-west corridors like Wells Branch Parkway was completed, uh, Clearville Parkway is completed, so um, Clearville has a transportation plan of some sort to Try to do the best it can with traffic. Do you want to talk about transportation? Yeah, well, transportation, again, as I, I mentioned, it was one of the big three items we had, traffic, water, and growth. And the um, at the time, east-west was almost uh, impossible in the city of Pflugerville. There was only one full-running east-west route in the city, and that was Pecan Street. Um, there was a long-range plan to develop um, six um, streets, three east and three west, or three east-west and three north-south, and uh, that is almost complete now. The, the completion of Wells Ranch Parkway, the expansion of Pecan Street, and then Pflugerville Parkway have been, uh, have been uh, a great improvement, and then uh, the other direction, the north-south roads, were going to be Heather Wild Boulevard, um, Dessau Road, which is, is complete now that turns into 685 and then the third road was going to be Finning Lane and and or excuse me um, yeah Finning Lane the way it would dogleg in off of um, Pecan Street and 685 back and so that was the that was the plan and uh, with the exception of that one section of Finning it's it's almost done now and uh, it's a lot easier to get around in Pflugerville now that those those very long-range plans you know, obviously with the growth, eventually there has to be more and uh, the Weiss Lane Corridor will become pretty important to the city and uh, there's recently work on Kelly Lane and so, uh, so as the community grows, the, the transportation plan has to grow also. Uh, SH 130, uh, when you first heard that it was going to happen and when it became a reality that, that period of time. SH 130 was a was a, a big announcement and uh, I think if you remember back to the days when they were planning 130 there were seven or eight routes and uh, some of them were incredibly close to Pflugerville. As a matter of fact one of them came right down um, Railroad Avenue. That was one of the the primary corridors but at that time it was just a um, major road and then the toll authority came into existence and and uh, there were still a number of routes, some of them close into Pflugerville, 
uh, one of them that went right almost uh, behind the Heritage House uh, in that area, one that was really, really far out that was out off of uh, Fox Grove Lane in that area, and then eventually the, the route that they chose. Um, strangely enough, the location of Lake Pflugerville was affected by um, the building of SH-130. Our initial choice for Lake Pflugerville is not where it is today, um, but the toll authority told us that they would not bear the cost of building a bridge across the lake because they weren't going to move the road when the uh, final plan. So um, the primary site for Lake Pflugerville was moved because of the construction of SH-130 to where it is now. Uh, when you were on the Parks and Rec Board, what were uh, some of the uh, agenda items and our issues that were faced and solutions that were found? Well, as a member of the Parks and Rec Commission, um, you know, there were, there, there, even today, um, the, some of the largest problems posed by the city with regards to recreational facilities for youth is, is the biggest issue. Um, baseball fields, uh, football fields, soccer fields, um, basketball courts, they're just uh, so limited um, availability and access to those type of facilities within the city of Pflugerville. Uh, the schools bear a lot of that in using their facilities, but for com residents that's very expensive to uh, use a school facility versus a um, community-owned facility. We only have one recreation center, and it's heavily programmed. There's a lot of uh, activity there. And uh, pools, um, you know, we have, we have a number of pools in the city of Pflugerville now, but a lot of those pools have been acquired from neighborhood associations. They've built them and either have found them to be financially burdensome to maintain or have um, decided that um, they want to relinquish that park space and pool to the city and uh, turn it into a city facility. But um, we were always challenged with funding. Um, the Parks Department splits the responsibility with mowing um, a lot of the streets and, and uh, items with the streets department. So every um, department, um, every group within the streets department or within the parks department has an area of responsibility to mow. And it makes sense because those are the two departments that have the most lawn mowers and lawn maintenance equipment. But um, on a rainy year like we're having this year uh, and a very wet spring, if we have one, um, the budget will be strapped because of the amount of uh, roadside maintenance and parks maintenance that will be required. And, um, you know, we were always trying to find new areas, new ways to create park space and to grow our existing park space, utilize the land that we have. A lot of the park land is in low water areas like Pfluger Park that we talked about earlier that floods. Um, a lot of the other facilities that um, we would incorporate are also in low water areas. And so there's, there's risk and reward there. It's, it's good land and it's, it's easy to access and it's um, available. The bad thing is that you can suffer extreme amounts of damage and loss in a flood event. And so it makes it hard to commit into those spaces without recognizing the loss. But when I was on the Parks Commission, um, we, uh, we heard a lot from the citizens. They attend the Parks and Rec meetings a lot organizations that are always looking for space for their activity. Baseball, softball, basketball, football, soccer, the, the big games. But then there's other um, smaller activities. Um, all the time I was on the city uh, council and when I was in the Parks and Rec Commission, we talked about a skate park for um, skateboarding and BMX bicycling. And uh, the city finally built a skate park and it's a very nice skate park and the county built a skate park and I participated on the committee that helped work that thing. And a lot of people don't know it, but the city has a BMX track. It's hidden in the woods off of, uh, off of Pecan Street, but the kids built it themselves and they maintain it themselves. And it's a, it's a great facility for BMX bikes. Is that uh, east of Emanuel and uh, on the creek? Yes. I, I see people parked on Pecan yes. and I, you never know what they're doing. That's, that's exactly where they're that's going. That's people are going back to the BMX area. Uh, so, uh, the county uh, built the Northeast Metro Park, and I don't even know what year, but that provided additional fields, but those fields were 
on R used more by uh, area and maybe even statewide participants as opposed to strictly local? Yes, the, um, you know, there was, again, it seems like everything in the city at one point or another is controversial and sometimes is political and, and the city made a couple of uh, concessional swaps with the county when that park was being built with regards to access and, and uh, availability of certain pieces of land. And, um, you know, it, it seemed like that agreement never really worked out the way it was supposed to, but um, I don't think that the, well, I think that you're correct that a lot of the programming that goes on in that, those parks is large leagues and in many cases out-of-town leagues, tournaments and competition, and not so much the, the activity of our youth soccer leagues, youth soccer organizations. Um, their facility that they have over off of uh, Wells Point in that area, um, if you recall way back when that took place in 2003, 2004, those soccer fields used to be across the street where there are industrial buildings now and there was a trade uh, made to build that facility over there um, to expand it and to uh, provide a parking lot and so forth to move that uh, soccer facility so those industrial buildings could be built and uh, that's worked out well. It was a, it was a real good uh, exchange and those fields are primarily used by our local youth soccer leagues but the Northeast Metro Park um, has not been um, a significant benefit to the local community other than the revenue. They hold some very large tournaments there every year and, and uh, we get a lot of people that visit our stores and restaurants uh, while those are going on. Part of the city infrastructure has been also to uh, be sure that there was adequate wastewater uh, provided and uh, within that region where the, the plant is there was eventually a recycling started and also community gardens. Uh, the community gardens come under Parks and Rec or was that a separate citizens group or um, the history on that? The community gardens that are near the wastewater treatment plant were part of the um, Parks and Rec activity and they were started uh, when I was on the council and then it continued when I was on the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, but you mentioned wastewater management and, um, and another person's name that I've mentioned previously, Rob Tiemann. Um, a lot of people don't uh, uh, you know, Rob Tiemann is a local developer, but he's a, he's a local person also, kids in our schools and, and very active in the community. Um, as I mentioned, and I thought that Doyle Bridge Farmer was a little bit visionary with regards to water, um, Rob Tiemann was visionary with regards to water and wastewater treatment. And as the development of the Blackhawk communities took place out there, <clears throat> he funded and connected all of the wastewater systems out there together to feed into the city system and shut down the three package um, water treatment plants were out there and if you ever lived in Blackhawk and you knew what that smelled like, that package plant that was there right uh, at the corner of Kinnemer uh, off of Kelly Lane, um, that package plant was shut down um, because of the activity of a developer who wanted to improve that entire area and not have three or four small package um, wastewater treatment plants that would have uh, certainly degraded the quality of life. So now all the way from, uh, from Row Lane, all the way to our city wastewater treatment plant, all of those communities drain to a common wastewater collector that feeds into the city plant. And that was an initiative by a developer, not the city. And I think the city has been uh, continually planning. I don't know we go to the word proactive, but to uh, upgrade the Gilliam plant uh, with technology and capacity to serve the growing community. Yes, and, and growing, the, growing our current wastewater treatment plant will be necessary. Um, there are a number of developments slated for the, again, the, the area out there near Hendrickson High School, um, the old Murchison property and further out there, and all of that will eventually tie into um, the wastewater infrastructure that the city has and to be able to handle the amount of wastewater and to be able to handle the amount of uh, treatment that's going to be required, um, newer technology and the expansion of that wastewater plant will have to take place. And one of the interesting things about our wastewater treatment plant also is we reclaim water from there and we sell it to the county for the county park and we sell it to a number of other locations, uh, golf courses. So there is a, a second water infrastructure in the city that allows us to use water reclaimed from the uh, wastewater plant 
for irrigating parks and uh, roadsides and so forth. So some people wonder um, in, the, in the tight water conditions that we have, they still see these people running these sprinkler systems. Well, that sprinkler system is probably being powered by reclaimed water that was taken from our, our wastewater. Uh, again, over your years here in Pflugerville, you've seen um, businessmen, um, community leaders, and our, the city leaders. So uh, think back, and you've mentioned several of the, uh, the mayors, or Mr. Tiemann. Are there any other individuals that you think were um, key players in the community? Well, I think there, there are a number of people in Pflugerville that, that have made a difference for the city of Pflugerville. I mentioned a few. Um, Doyle Bridge Farmer was a local businessman, lots of children in the school system, and, uh, and worked hard in the community, worked at St. Elizabeth's Church and volunteered there, and uh, served on the city, served for the city as our mayor. Um, a number of developers, there's uh, been some people that are local or even some out-of-town developers that have had a real good eye for what Pflugerville needs and, and could be done there. The, um, some of the uh, community development that uh, took place in the Highland Park area and then out uh, off of uh, Kelly and Row Lane, some of those developments, if you go to them, they're, they're very well done and they've maintained the, the value of the land. Um, we have, um, you know, recently lost uh, John Pfluger, a very, uh, very good person for the city and uh, did a lot of uh, excellent work with regards to uh, representing the community when land was being bought and sold and, uh, and, and always spoke highly of the community here, um, was a, a very uh, strong advocate. Um, we had, uh, you know, some of the older residents in the city of Pflugerville, uh, Mr. Bowles um, was here and he would come frequently to the city council meetings. And sometimes, um, sometimes he seemed like a critic, but sometimes he seemed like an advisor. When we were talking about really tough issues, Mr. Bowles would sometimes take one or two of us aside and say, you know, this is another way you could approach a solution to this issue. Um, so he had a lot of experience, not only um, in this community, but in the city government of the community. Um, at the time I was uh, initially started in this community, our chief of police was David Beezing. And uh, David was a, a very um, well-known person in the law enforcement community, but he was also an excellent citizen. And uh, it would not be uncommon to find him periodically out in your neighborhood walking around just greeting people um, to keep his face familiar. And I think he did a great job of uh, leadership in our community. And um, some of the churches have very strong uh, voices in them. The, uh, the Emmanuel Lutheran Church, the pastor there, Mr. Uh, um, Kesselring, I believe. Um, just a, a, a great person to hear him speak, a great speaker. And he talks strongly about the youth in our community and the strength of the youth in our community and, and how important it is that uh, we keep our children involved in the community and involved in their church. So um, there are some great, great people in the, in the city that have done um, a lot for the city of Pflugerville. Um, to be admired. When you go back to uh, uh, being in the elected seat, there are uh, challenges, there are uh, plans, and sometimes the plans go as expected, and then sometimes they don't go, or you learn from your mistakes. Uh, so if you, again, look back, what were some challenges that were faced, and maybe uh, the paths took other directions. So as I served on the City Council again there were um, there were a lot of challenges without a doubt. There were uh, you know dozens and dozens of challenges weekly. Um, controversial challenges that came up. One of them that came up was the um, development of an airport in the city of Pflugerville. Um, the Austin Bergstrom Airport was going to be closed. Um, it was going to relocate um, to the, or the Austin Airport downtown was going to close. It was going to relocate and they said they weren't going to allow private aviation. And there were a number of indications that there was an opportunity to build a close in to Austin airport facility that would serve um, commuting, um, light freight, all those type of things. And the city council took that up again under Doyle Bridge Farmer and uh, was met with immediate resistance. Um, the community absolutely um, just a, a number of people, and again, sometimes you, you, it sounds like a lot, but just a few people can make a lot of noise. 
there were people in the community that absolutely were opposed to the airport. They came to the meetings, they protested, they walked around with picket signs and, and so forth. And eventually the city dropped that um, activity and, and abandoned the process. And wouldn't you know today, that airport is built in the exact location that the city was gonna do it, we just don't own it now. It would have been a city of Pflugerville Airport, now it's a, it's a general aviation airport. So it was interesting that, that we went much ado about nothing and then the airport got built exactly where it was gonna be built to begin with. So um, that was one. The other one was there was a big uh, political issue at one time about a horse racing facility that was gonna be built out on, um, out on uh, Pecan Street near where the toll road sits now in the industrial park. And uh, you know, the people on the city council, there were a few that endorsed it and a few that didn't and a few that were um, kind of non-committal about it. But, uh, you know, I was, um, I was somewhat advocating it because they were going to build the road that we needed. We needed uh, Pecan Street and the eastern block of, of, of the going east route of that road completed out there because at that time we were talking about the eastern route of um, Pecan Street and then the connection of Finnig Lane uh, back around um, and the developer was saying that that would come with the activity. The county at that time owned that road and they refused to do anything with it. Um, they, they refused to, to spend a single penny there and there was a lot of infrastructure that needed to be taken care of, drainage and, and so forth. Um, and so it was uh, very controversial but you know most of us kind of knew from the beginning it wasn't going to happen. But uh, what we were hoping to do is, is get somebody committed to funding that road and putting up the money for it, or at least getting a wedge driven in between uh, the county and their wallet to help them fund part of that road. But all of it fell apart. It was a big social blow up and so forth. But um, there was actually an election, though, wasn't it? Yeah, there was. A, there, was it very close in the? Uh, um, I thought it was. Thought it was uh, yeah, very, it was very close. Uh, I and. It was very yeah, it was it was very close, and uh, and you know there were there were a few other um, items that that popped up here and there that seemed to be extremely controversial, and then you know as you you know figured it out, it really wasn't that big of a deal at all. Um, but you know that's politics; is you have good days and bad days, and you know. Yeah. Uh, so the city chambers, uh, from what they look like today, and when you served, have uh, expanded a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> Yes, when I first moved to the city of Pflugerville and I attended a few city council meetings, we were held in the building across the parking lot in a small room, a very small room. And at that time, there was a, a gentleman named, um, oh, I can't even think of his name now. Wade. Um, Wade? No, no, I can't think of it. But he was the city ma manager, or he was the city council um, person, and he was, he was the mayor. And he was, uh, he was loud, and he was uh, kind of noisy. And it was a little room, a very small room. It was like having a meeting in a closet. And, uh, and then the decision was made to build this building we're in now, Suite 500, which uh, um, we, uh, all the time that I was on the council, this is where we met, is in this room. Uh, but uh, prior to that, you would, um, you would meet in the building across the parking lot, and uh, you would set elbow to elbow in that room with all the people that came to the meeting. It was a very small facility for having a city council meeting. Uh, so over the time, did, were citizens, uh, did they come uh, to the meetings to just listen or they had an agenda that they wanted you to hear? Well, Haywood Ware was the name I was trying to think of there. So the mayor, he was, uh, he was big and loud, but he got a lot of stuff done. So. Um, I think that everybody that comes to a city council meeting, with the exception of the students that are asked to come here by their high school civics teacher, everybody walks in a room has an agenda. They're here for a reason. Um, if it's no more than just to listen and see what's going on, um, but most of the time people will read the agenda um, that the city council is having or there's been an issue in their neighborhood or there has been um, something that's happened that brings them here and they're here for a reason and they want to tell us about it. And um, you know, sometimes it's as, as, uh, as little as the garbage man picked up the garbage and he dropped paper in the street and he didn't pick it up. And so I had to go out and pick up the paper after the trash truck. Um, all the way to the intersection in front of my entrance in my neighborhood is unsafe and there's going to be an accident or there has been an accident. And, uh, and then bigger things, the, the organizations that come that, that really need uh, support or assistance. Um, 
you know, one of the very first things when I was on the city council that changed was we were members of Capital Metro. And within my first six months of being on the council, we voted out of Capital to Metro. And it seemed very controversial at the time because um, we had bus service that came down to the high school parking lot. But the argument for voting out of Capital Metro was they came here twice a day to take people out of the city to go work somewhere else and to bring them home. But there was nothing being done by the Capital Metro organization to support moving people around in our community to help the people that needed transportation to get to and from their work here in, in Pflugerville. And we weren't a big city, but we had a number of businesses. We had the Albertsons and the HEB and a few other um, businesses that were beginning to grow. And uh, we weren't being served by that Capital Metro transportation. And so we voted out of it. And it was very controversial at the time. And uh, you know, today, I don't know that it's hurt us at all. And the cost was, uh, we had to pay a, a certain number of cents? We pay, yeah, it was, a, it was a, well, I think it was a half a cent on our tax rate. And as the city grew, that was a huge number. I mean, we paid, we paid a lot of money for a very little amount of service. And so uh, we felt it was uh, prudent to get out of there. We stopped um, the Capital Metro and we converted that tax to our money now that funds our PCDC, our um, development tax. And, uh, and that allows our, our city and the city government to entice businesses to come here, upgrade infrastructure for business development, and, uh, and I think was a very good move for us. So do you remember the birth of PCDC? I do. Um, I was on the council when it, it came about. And uh, it was shortly after we enacted the tax that um, canceled Capital Metro and added the, um, the, the development tax. And uh, we started to, to build a war chest there. And so initially, the PCDC activities, the development activities were coordinated for us by the chamber. And we were paying a fee to the Chamber of Commerce. But at a certain point in time, and I think this was just based on the way other cities handled that activity, um, we recognized that the chamber, um, they were doing a good job for us. The chamber was, was doing a, a, an excellent job for what the Chamber of Commerce's purpose is, but we needed an organization that was dedicated, specifically focused and dedicated on the economic development of the city. And so we formed the PCDC, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's worked well for us. Mm -hmm. And it go, went through the birthing stage of organizing and then finally got its feet on the ground and uh, uh, yeah, it, it's in its own right now. It's on its own now. It took, um, you know, it, it took some fits and some starts to get that thing going. It, it, it took many years for it to actually get its feet up under it. And I, part of that is because initially you don't have a lot of money in the chest. Um, so you can't really offer or attract um, people if you don't have a lot to offer. But then we... Um, you know, we were able to, um, you know, build enough of a war chest to, to become attractive and then people will come talk to you and, and we've been able to, to get some businesses here. Excuse me just a second. Is that an alarm going off on my phone? Yeah, you can just hit that dismiss button and it'll shut that off. But you probably have to push it up. Like, put your finger on it and push it up. There we go. Go away, yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, recently, Pflugerville has been in different magazines uh, and ranked highly as a place to live for quality of life, etc. Uh, what do you like about living in Pflugerville? You know, I. What do I like about living? In, I mean, I think Pflugerville is a wonderful place to live. Um, just based on on how I've been in the community and the involvement that I have in the community, I know a lot of people, and and Pflugerville is filled with a lot of really great people, a lot of people with good ideas, great support, great volunteerism, a wonderful community. Um, you feel welcome here, and uh, and it's it's a great place to live. I feel safe when I'm in Pflugerville. I think that it's a, we're a safe community. And, uh, and we, we certainly have our share of the big box stores and you could go to Target and Home Depot and the big Walmart and so forth, but you can also walk downtown and browse through some of the smaller shops and, and still get the flavor of a, of a small town. And, uh, and in Pflugerville, I, I know all of my neighbors and, uh, and I think that's a great thing. Um, it's, a, it's a quiet town. Um, there's, there's not a lot of uh, hubbub here and, 
and, and disturbances, but it's, um, it's a growing town. And, uh, and I think we've grown gracefully. So. Um, Citizens on Patrol is another volunteer group that uh, originated uh, several years back and has provided a wonderful service. Do you want to tell us about Citizens on Patrol? Well, um, the Citizens on, Patrol, Citizens on Patrol activity, when it came about, um, I was invited to be in the first class of Citizens on Patrol. Um, a number of people that had been involved in different ways in the community, in uh, Facona or the City Council or Parks and Rec, um, those people were asked and, and essentially it was, it was pitched as we're going to teach you a little bit about what the police department does and what they know and we're going to teach you to become eyes and ears to help the police department do a better job. And so um, when we started off on Citizens on Patrol it was uh, 13 or 15 weeks of night classes and we had presentations from police officers and the sheriff's department and we got, uh, we got instructed on what they look for when they uh, they uh, show up in areas where there's been disturbances or vandalism or anything else like that. And we were encouraged to go ride along with police officers and, and most of us did that. And, uh, and you'd be surprised at the things that go on in Pflugerville on a Saturday night after midnight if you ride along with a police officer. But um, it was, a, it was a, a great experience and I'm still a member of the Citizens on Patrol, not as active as I used to be. But, um, but it's, a, it's a great organization. It's brought in hundreds of citizens to help them better understand the police department and better understand what goes on in their community. One of the amazing things you do as a citizen happens on July the 4th. Mm. Tell us what you do on July the 4th for some very special uh, people. Well, in, uh, on July the 4th, I think this started when I was uh, on the city council. Um, I recognize that several of the police officers and the EMS individuals work on that day and, and, and then sometimes it's a busy day in the city with uh, firecrackers and the traffic and activity and so we started holding a July 4th picnic and so I send out flyers and I invite all of the on duty um, police, fire, EMS um, to come to my house and have the 4th of July lunch with us and we cook hamburgers and hot dogs and bratwurst and we have um, sodas and decorations and everything and uh, some years when they're not as busy um, we've had we've had uh, 40 or 50 members of the community that are, that are working that day stop by um, the people from dispatch send somebody down to make up plates and take it back there and then I invite my entire neighborhood and I invite everybody that I work with and so forth so we've had we've had years where we've had 300 people show up for the 4th of July picnic on my front lawn and, uh, and some years it's been slower, but uh, we've done that now um, 15 or 16 years and enjoy doing it, have a great time doing it, and uh, always look forward to meeting all the new people when they show up. And the kids that are there get a blast out of it when they pull the fire truck up and park it right in front of my house, so. And it's amazing because that's all uh, very generous and very charitable because I know it comes out of your pocket and out of your heart. It does, and, and I enjoy doing it. I think they do a, uh, they do a great job for us every day of the year and it's it's the least I can do to to recognize them one day and invite them to my house and come over and have a meal. So. I had another question on Deutschenfest, the parade marshals. Yes. Uh, who were some of the parade marshals you remember that were um, selected and how? Well, the, um, the, the, the most notable parade marshal we had was the, the gentleman that starred or was one of the cast members in the uh, Wizard of Oz and uh, he came out and he wore his suit from the uh, from the movie and uh, rode in the parade and when he was done we gave him a plaque with his picture on it of him riding on the parade and uh, and and so he was probably one of the most notable we've had a couple of uh, famous football players as parade marshals and then um, we've had uh, a lot of local figures. Um, we had Mr. Bowles, um, a former mayor here, and, uh, and people like that. But uh, it's always been, it's always a challenge to find out who you're going to ask. Um, and so we've, uh, we've always tried to make very wise choices in that and picking somebody that, that people would recognize or that people would want to, to know and see. And so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun picking some of those people for the parade marshal. Back to your photography. Yes. When you snapped that picture, who were some of the people that you captured that said to yourself, 
why I'm glad I got that photo. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's people and sometimes it's things. And uh, when they decided to build the Walmart here, and we looked at the place where they were going to build the Walmart, um, there was a piece of uh, property there. There was a pickup truck that was an old Dodge pickup truck that had been parked in a field for a long time, and a tree had grown up through the engine box. And uh, and I had asked about that, and I had been down there before and taken a couple of pictures of it just because of, of curiosity, kind of an Americana thing. And then I heard that it was going to be bulldozed um, when they were going to build the Walmart. So I contacted the family, and I asked if I could go down there and take the picture of that, do a real nice picture of that truck. And, uh, and so that was one of those things that it's, it's a little bit of a transition from the old Pflugerville to the new Pflugerville. Taking pictures of many of the older homes here in Pflugerville and the water tower and, and again obviously the stadiums and, and, and sports figures. Um, there are some people that uh, you know I've looked at through my camera lens. Um, our current mayor, um, uh, Jeff Coleman, um, during the 9-11 ceremony, it was very good pictures. Um, it was amazing, the background that that, that picture, picture presented. Um, like I said, some of the pictures at the Fallen Warrior Memorial I've never shared with people. Um, there, are, uh, there are different people at different times when you see them um, through the camera lens. Um, I do shoot video now and again, but I prefer the still camera because you, you capture a moment of an event, not the event, and and sometimes an event, you know, it has as it rises and it falls and, and so forth, and you can't spend the time to sit and watch a video for 20 or 30 or 45 minutes to get the impression of everything that's there, so you try to find that picture, that single picture that helps people understand what was going on at that, that moment in time, how important that moment in time was, and Pflugerville has had a lot of importance um, times in its history that since I've been here. As a closing statement, is there anything you would like to say to the citizens of Pflugerville today that uh, in celebration of the 50th anniversary and art and your vision for the future? Well, I think that um, Pflugerville is growing and it's going to continue to grow. And, and I know there's two sides of the coin there. Some people don't want us to grow and, and growth is inevitable and, uh, and it can be good and, and I think it has been good. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we used to hear on the city council all the time was people said, well, I used to be able to sit and look out my window and I would see cows. And I agree with that. I used to be able to, when I would drive to work, leave my house, I'd go down uh, my street and turn to go up to Pecan Street and I would see cows at the end of the street. And then as I drove by the dairy, the Swinson Dairy area, you'd see cows there. Um, the city has grown and, uh, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think that, that we should be prepared for growth and we should know that the growth is a good thing for us. It, it offers us more um, for our kids. It offers us a lot more for our future. If you can just think of the number of, uh, of high school kids here in the city of Pflugerville now that have jobs at all of the local stores and restaurants and, and are able to, uh, to earn a little bit of money and, and help themselves um, with uh, their um, casual expenses and going to the movie theater and taking their date out, that type of thing. When Pflugerville was really small, those opportunities weren't really as big um, here. Um, so um, some people are uncomfortable with the growth, but I think growth is good. It's brought us a lot of um, wonderful things. Um, you can go out to the lake, you can walk by our fire station and just look at the quality of some of the facilities um, that the city has been able to bring here based on its growth. Um, not forced growth, but uh, careful, measured growth. And, you know, I think Pflugerville will be a great place to live in the future, just as great as it is now. And the growth seems to be going east, so that is like being able to plan a completely new city, a uh, new area. That's right. The, the growth to the east, uh, especially once you get east of the toll road, it's, it's open land. It's a blank slate, so it can be whatever we want it to be. And, and again, it's up to us. We can control that. We can prescribe how that land is developed and how it, uh, how it grows and develops in the future. And it can be, um, the new growth of Pflugerville can be as good and as personal, have the same feel as the existing Pflugerville. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, you've been an inspirational person in the community and thank you so much for your service in so many arenas and truly making a difference 
and right. impacting well, thank the you. present and the future. Well, thank you. And you are one of those people also, every day, part of Pflugerville.